I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. Look who's talking. That's, that was the title of a movie, wasn't it, a few years ago? I, I find, for some odd reason, movie titles often serve as sermon titles. You'd be amazed at how few movies I've actually seen. I don't know how many conversations I get. Somebody says, hey, did you see such and such movie? No, I didn't see that one. Well, did you see? No, I didn't see that one either. Jill and I live very sheltered lives, apparently. We're just too cheap to go to the theater, I guess, maybe, is it. But for whatever reason, I remember the titles, and I sort of remember a little bit about the plot of the movies, but by and large, there's so many we haven't seen that it's just really not even funny. So anyway, look who's talking. I think that movie had something to do with a little baby that was highly intelligent, spoke to his parents, whatever. But anyway, we're going to see a little different purpose and meaning in look who's talking as we consider these opening words in the book of Hebrews this morning. As we think about talking, I want to pose to you the question, would you like to have God speak to you? Would you like a word from God? If you're like me, I've always wanted that. I wanted God just once to just very plainly, audibly speak and forever settle some issues in my life. I wanted him to talk to me. And of course, I'm wondering if God would speak, what would he say? That's kind of a two-edged sword because while I want a reassuring word, he might say, you know, there's some stuff you got messed up you need to get straight in your life. And there might be that. There's that possibility. But nevertheless, it seems like a good thing that God would speak. And there have been plenty of times in my life in exasperation when I yelled out, God, just talk to me. Just say something to me. Don't be so silent. I need a word. And I'm probably not the only one. I imagine many others of you have said that. God, if you just would give me an audible word. In some case, it doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be a big paragraph, a whole book. Just simply even a yes or a no. Just that little still small voice. But just simply say something. Fact of the matter is, God is speaking to us very actively. And the priority is for us to be able to hear and to know where and how it is that he's speaking. And so I look back on my exasperation wanting God to speak. I guess I probably wasn't listening and looking in the right places. Because I realize God has a lot to say about where and how it is he's speaking. I want you to look just at the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. And uh, I want to share these verses out of the New Jerusalem Bible translation. I, I think it words it rather interesting. Follow along with whatever translation you have. But I want you to notice how this is worded. And especially note what is being said about God communicating to us. It says at many moments in the past and by many means God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. But in our time... The final days, he has spoken to us in the person of his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the ages. He is the reflection of God's glory and bears the impress of God's own being, sustaining all things by his powerful command. And now that he has purged sins away, he has taken his seat at the right hand of the divine majesty. On high, So he is now as far above the angels as the title which he has inherited is higher than their own name. Maybe that gives you just a little different perspective on what we're reading and the translation that you have there. God spoke. Those two words jump out at me. We have a God who has spoken. There are plenty of people that may believe that there is a creator God who made everything that exists, but that he, he stepped away, retreated into silence, and has kind of let things just run on their own and had nothing to do or to say with it since that time. I don't believe it for a minute. I believe here that it, when it says that God spoke, that we have a God who is not silent, that God is not retreated to a distance, but that God is actively trying to communicate with His creation. And I, for one, find that very encouraging. I have a God that's engaged, a God who's with it, a God who wants to communicate certain things to me, to us, His people. The writer of Hebrews says that God spoke long ago 
to the fathers in the prophets. Again, God spoke, and how has God been speaking? In one particular instance, back ages ago, God spoke to the fathers, the people of Israel. God spoke through prophets. A very interesting way to communicate truth. As one writer said, it was not God's way to write his word in the sky or to shout it for the mountains for all to hear or to whisper it one by one in the heart of every Israelite. His usual way was to call a prophet and then inspire the prophet to speak and to write to the people what God wanted said. And such it has been. There were credentials for prophets. God also spoke and indicated how you know a real prophet from a phony. But that has been God's way in the past. He would take certain individuals and God would set them aside. God would speak to them and speak through them and God communicated to the fathers through those prophets. What exactly was God saying through the prophets? And while that's a, a pretty big task to try to cover on a Sunday morning, there's been consistent themes of what God has been trying to get across. And so what has God been saying to and through the prophets? Contrary to a popular song from a bygone generation, the words of the prophets are not written on subway walls. Not everybody will get that. Some of you are way too young to get that. There's a whole generation that's never even heard of Simon and Garfunkel, so you have no idea what I was just talking about, but that was the lyrics from the 70s uh, that I remember about where the words of the prophets were written. No, they're not written on the subway walls. They're written in this amazing book we call the Bible. But what has God said through his prophets? Again, there's been a consistent theme. For example, Isaiah one of the great prophets, 45 verse 5, I am Yahweh, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. What was God communicating in the prophets? I'm it. I'm God. I have a name. And there is absolutely none other beside me. I am a singular entity. Zechariah 14 verse 9, Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one, and His name the only one. Again, something singular. There is but one God. In this case, there will just be the one God over all the earth. Something of His person. Something of His name. Something of His kingdom. That is a very consistent theme throughout all the prophets, so it should come as no surprise... When Jesus comes onto the earthly scene and he teaches us how to pray, the, the two key themes that he touches on in that model prayer happen to line up with that consistent theme of the prophets. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God in the past communicating to the fathers through the prophets says, I'm God alone and I will reign supreme. I reign now and ultimately on the earth I will reign supreme. His name, His reputation, and His kingdom. Those are consistent themes from the prophets. Isaiah 1, 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. God communicated consistently regarding the problem of sin and the solution for it. A God who is holy and just, who has standards, but He says we can sit down and we can reason this through. We can deal with the problem of sin. We can take care of that. And so God has been communicating that message. Moses, the Lord is speaking, speaking through him, the Lord your God, He said, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, you shall listen to him. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, a few verses down, verse 18. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, like Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. You see some consistency with that and what we just read in Hebrews. God said long ago, I got somebody I'm going to raise up, and I'm going to put my words in his mouth. And he is going to speak exactly what I tell him to speak. 
That fits so consistently with what we read in the first few verses in Hebrews 1. God spoke in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. When I think of the wide variety of ways that God has been trying to get his message across, he's gone to some tremendous great lengths to do so. He set aside some prophets and gave them some vivid uh, imaginations, shall we say, uh, visions. He gave them dreams and communicated his truth in that way. One of the prophets was kind of reluctant, so he swallowed him up in a great fish. He got the message. He did what he was called to do. Another one of his prophets, he had Mary a prostitute. That one always really blows my mind. But an illustration of Israel's unfaithfulness. He used the example of his own marriage to get his message across. Another was commanded to lie on his side for 390 days. And then after that, to lie on his other side for 40 days. That had to be more difficult than we could begin to imagine, but that is how God communicated his message. God went to great lengths to creatively and passionately communicate his message through those prophets. But as we read in Hebrews, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son. I want you to notice last days, the end of it all. In these last days, in the final form, in the last act, God is now communicating through His Son. We are living in the last days. We've been living in the last days since the days of Christ. The last days have been about 2,000 years so far. These are the last days of history as we know it before the final and full establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth. We are in the last days. And in the last days, God has one exclusive way that He is communicating. It is only through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the writer drives home a point that we need to make sure we pick up on, that, that the word that God speaks is in and through His Son. It is decisive and authoritative final words that He has. It will not be followed by any other greater word or replacement word. This is the Word of God. And in fact, it is the Word made flesh in a very real sense. So in the final act of all of history, this is uniquely how God is communicating to us in this day. And He wants us to know that His Son is more than just one of the prophets. Again, He is His Son, the unique Son of God, uniquely qualified for God to speak through. We are told that He has been appointed, that God has put Him in charge of everything. And so God has designated him. He is the central idea through which everything that God created exists, we're told here as well. We are told that he perfectly reflects God's glory and that he perfectly and visibly represents the nature and the character of the Father who cannot be seen. You do not get a better spokesman than that. And so in the last days, God has designated him in all of those ways. In these last days, God is communicating exclusively through His Son. And when I read that in the last days, He's communicating through His Son, I take that to mean that He was not around for God to communicate through before that time. And so I personally believe from Scripture that Jesus existed in the mind and in the plan of God before anything was ever created, but there was a point in time when He came into existence, when He was born in Bethlehem. That was the beginning of the reality of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, I want you to notice what the Apostle Peter writes saying concerning Jesus, that He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared, has come into being in these last days for the sake of you who through Him are believers in God. Again, God is communicating in these last days. God has something to say, and what He has to say to us, again, is exclusively through His Son. I think about what God wanted us to know on the day when Jesus was baptized. You know the story, Matthew chapter 3. Verse 17, as he came up out of the water, it says, A voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. There's a word from God, an audible word. God made it plain for every person gathered there that day. This is my Son. I'm immensely pleased with Him. Went so far as to say on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, verse 5, to the disciples were there. It says, A voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, again, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to Him. 
pay attention to my boy. He's got something to say. Because I put my words in his mouth. And everything that he says reflects perfectly what I want communicated in these last days. God is communicating through his son. Writer of Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 1, based on all this, says, For this reason... For the overwhelming evidence of the superiority and the uniqueness of how God is communicating through His Son, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. I think there's something very significant in that. It's easy for us to say, I'm familiar with the words of Jesus. I, I studied the Gospels from the time of my childhood. I know about the Gospels. That's one of the dangers of Scripture. You can know and, and get away from really knowing. It's easy enough to look at those familiar words. Now, that's a struggle for me daily. I'll read a, a passage in the morning and say, well, I know that really well. It's easy to kind of glance over that, uh, to kind of be in a fog as I read it. And yet I'm reminded what is said here. I've got to pay much closer attention to what I've heard because I don't want to drift away from that. If God is speaking only through His Son in this day and age, I better listen carefully to what the Son has to say. If I don't pay close attention, I'm going to drift in my faith. And that's a terrible thing to have happen. I must pay much closer attention to what I've heard. I want to make sure I hear God's voice through the Son of God. John chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative that I speak these things as the Father taught me. An amazingly consistent thing concerning Jesus is he always deferred to his father. Never once, I, I challenge you, never once in Scripture, in the Gospels in particular, will you find him taking credit for something himself. He always deferred it to his father, giving us a great pattern and example. I do nothing of my own initiative. I don't teach anything of my own initiative. I, I received it from the father. What I see him doing, that's what I do. What I've been taught by the father... That's what I teach to you. And so in all humility, he defers to his heavenly Father. And as such, God is indeed speaking to and through him. We need to pay much closer attention to what God is saying through his son Jesus. If we are listening carefully to Jesus, we will know that he is not one and the same as his Father. That's pretty basic, but we understand that. When he is speaking, we re realize that he is God's son, not God himself. Again, never takes credit for his action or his teaching, but deferring again to his father. Much like was said of Moses, I will raise up a prophet. I will put my words within him. We understand that clearly. No prophet ever dared to claim that he was the father. A prophet was a spokesman for God. Jesus is a prophet in a sense. He's a spokesperson for God. He never claims to be the father, but his spokesperson, and uniquely so, as his son. I think, and I know this is a challenging thought to, to throw out there, but I believe the first obstacle to really hearing Jesus, I honestly believe, is confusing him with his father. And I would say those of you in this room who have sorted through this issue of knowing that God is not the same as His Father, I believe that you would be able to amen and say there is clarity in hearing the Son and hearing the Father's words in knowing they're not the same being. Isn't that a liberating truth? Is there any amen to that? Amen. You were hesitant. <laughs> but I believe you know that to be the case. It is tremendously liberating to know who He is, to know who His Father is, and to know what God is saying through His Son. Indeed, what is God trying to say through His Son? And when we consider that, we know that we have got to go back to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've got to study them even more carefully than ever before. And we have to see what He is saying with the authority of God, and in particular, what He's saying about the so-called Old Testament. I've suggested this experiment to a number of people. I believe this is something important to do. Go to the Gospels. Study them carefully. And every time there is a reference to the Old Testament, don't just read it and move on. Stop and take a look at what, what Jesus is trying to tell us of the Old Testament. Let Him be your teacher because, again, God exclusively is working through Him in the last day. So what is He trying to reveal to us of the Old Testament? What God was doing in the past? What is Jesus instructing and teaching us regarding that? So we go back 
and we carefully research everything that he references, and I think that can be a lifetime project. I think that we can devote the rest of our life doing that, and it's that big of a project, but it's that important to do. What is God saying through his son? That's one thing to do. The other thing to consider is what is Jesus saying today with God's authority to us, the people of God, the church? I'm reminded in Revelation 2 and 3 that God has something to say through his son to the church. And many of these things will apply. Many of these th things are challenging. Because if you read Revelation 2 and 3, you will say that he's communicating things like you've left your first love. You need to get back to your first love. You're tolerant of false teaching. You need to be pro-truth. You need to draw the line. He might even say you're spiritually dead. You need to wake up. He may say that because he said that to one of those churches. He might simply commend us for being faithful and saying, you're doing all right, hang in there, remain in my strength. He might say you're lukewarm. He might say all those things. But what is he saying to us, the people of God, the church today? What is he saying to us in these last days? Uh, I believe it's very possible for there to be a quiet word that speaks to us. We can have our personal devotional time and we might have that quiet word that has the authority of God coming through His Son. Maybe speaking to us in some very specific ways and getting into this area of so-called prophecy that's kind of challenging and it has to be approached carefully. I'm reminded in the, in the book of Acts in chapter 11, verses 27 to 29, it says that there were raised up some prophets in the early church and they were given a specific message regarding a coming worldwide famine. That message was given so that the church could get ready and deal with that crisis that would come. I wonder... And I just wonder out loud, is God working that same way through His Son today? Is there a word of prophecy? Is there an immediate word He has for the people of God today? Perhaps in the times that we live in, is there a crisis coming like there was then? Does He have a word for us today so as to be ready for what is to come? I'm just asking the question. I don't know the answer. I've wondered that for a long time. But again, in these last days, God is speaking through His Son is perhaps he's speaking to us in ways like that. Whatever is to be said, I know this much to be true, there will be a certain relevancy to those words. It may be the words of Scripture, maybe the Gospels, a particular passage jumps out. It's like, wow, that really speaks to present circumstances. There may be that, but I know there will be a great consistency with what's already been said because God is not going to communicate anything contrary to what is already in His written Word. So there will be familiar words, but they may have a certain ring of authority like they did not have before. Again, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. We are challenged to listen carefully, to discuss among ourselves what God is saying through His Son to us today, and above all, to do those things that are being said today.